Well, I was going to sit here, but I think it's better if we sit there and then we move. Um, oh, you look so friendly there. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in some way, you are friends because uh, we are sharing, like uh, any other media, a big audience. One of the challenges we have is like to make and engage our own audience. So I want to present uh, first, uh, Patrick, which is quite well known for being the founder of the Web. I'm sure that uh, most of you, like me, are subscribers of their uh, widely known newsletter. I use it uh, more often than the website, but I go through it every day. And um, they are one of those uh, websites that are leading the new wave of uh, ways to tell media about tech and our 100 per 100 digital. So it's a pleasure to have you here and you have you. your 15 minutes, which are going to be just 10, I'm sure, yeah. to explain what, Thank you. what the next web Barça. is. Thank you. Buenos dias, Barça. Oh. Todo bien? Buenos dias, Barça, todo bien. Cinco palabras es el único de español que lo conozco. Something like that. Like 12 years ago, I lived in Argentina for a while. That's why I have the funny accent in Spanish. Um, I was almost fluent with girls at the bar in Spanish. But then, you know, I, I, I moved back to Europe and I lost almost all my Spanish. But I'm really good at um, uh, listening to uh, listening into conversations in Spanish. So if you if you say something about me where I'm, you know, I'm standing next to you, I can hear what you say. So that's... Uh, the disclaimer for today. Um, yeah, this is uh, always, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me um, uh, and thanks for, for all being here this early today. Um, four years from now, uh, in four years from now, this projector would work. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, that's what, what happens. And maybe it's even better that that, that projector is not working because uh, then you would see my face probably. Uh, and uh, that's not uh, the most pleasant thing you can see in, uh, on a morning like this. Well, uh, mobile phones on. I mean, normally you always say mobile phones off, please. Uh, but here we're at uh, four years from now, World Mobile Congress. So I expect everybody to have their mobile phones on and, you know, tweet, meerkat, uh, Instagram, whatever you like. Um, <coughs> my name is Patrick. I'm the co-founder of the Next Web. Uh, that's my email address in case you want to uh, uh, reach out to me. Uh, and that's uh, my Twitter handle. <coughs> Very short story of uh, where I am or where I was. Um, yeah, it's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So at some point somebody said, you know, you should get, a, get rid of the hair, it's better. Uh, and uh, they were right. Uh, so that was in 2006. Uh, when I actually started the next web, I, I'm based out of an accident. We had a we had a startup, and we had no clue how to promote it. And then somebody said, you know, what you should do is you should or, uh, you should go to a conference. And back then there were no conferences, and also I had uh, no money to go to a conference. So we organized one ourselves. So that was this in 2006. It looked something like this. It was very you know very cool. Um, now, in 2014, I got rid of my hair. I also bought a suit, which I'm only wearing a couple of times a year, actually. So normally, I'm just wearing my Nikes and, and uh, uh, some other casual gear. Uh, and uh, next to me is uh, the king of the Netherlands. Um, so uh, I was very happy to be on a picture with him. It's not Photoshopped. And it looks something like this. It's a great conference. It's at the end of April. <coughs> uh, about three and a half thousand people show up there. It's one of the best produced conferences. Uh, we also have sometimes a problem with the uh, projectors that happens to the best. Um, the next web. We have seven million people visiting us every month. Um, 
and 50% uh, of, of those are from the United States. Why I mention that uh, number is that we are the only one, uh, the, well, the only one, the only publisher or tech media company, as you wish, that is based out of Europe originally uh, and is uh, one of the big players in the world. Um, so we have a global reach um, and uh, yeah, quite a, quite a massive, uh, well, quite a big following on, uh, on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Google+. Plus, um, and uh, we have about 10,000 startups reaching out to us uh, each year, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. And of course, uh, we, cover not, we can't cover everybody, but we try to cover a lot of them. Um, but it's uh, a number. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, some business models in, in publishing. Uh, and I'll take you back to the good old days. It was quite easy. There were two models, uh, and, and the publishers were really in a nice situation. They were uh, uh, getting, sorry about this. <coughs> Uh, they were uh, uh, charging consumers to get access to their content and uh, charging uh, companies to get access to their audience. But then this beautiful thing happened and we had the World Wide Web and it changed everything. So the digital versions of that old model are basically subscriptions and uh, banner ads. But both models are dead or are going to die very, very soon. So. I am kind of like in the publishing business, although we present ourselves as a tech media company. Um, but if those models are dead, why am, I, why am I so excited about this time? Well, right now it's 2015, I believe, um, and we have about 2.5 billion people online. But there are way more people in the world. So over the next years, uh, we will get a lot more uh, people online. Uh, the estimations are 5 billion by 2020, and uh, by 2028, there will be more people online than living on the planet right, right now, which is quite amazing. Um, they are probably talking about my soon-to-be-born son here. Um, but yeah, in other words, and it's not, this doesn't... Uh, goes only for the uh, publishing business, but for each and every digital business, so for all your businesses as well, we are all in the right place, in the right business, and there's a huge opportunity. Okay, but we have some very, uh, in the publishing scene, we have some very uh, valuable assets. Uh, some of them uh, you probably know. Um, we have uh, high quality content, uh, a lot of expertise, social media, trust, and traffic. And if you look at technology companies, you know, publishers have often troubles monetizing traffic. A normal technology company don't ha doesn't have uh, uh, much trouble with uh, monetizing traffic. The problem they have is they don't have traffic. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a situation where well, I think the publisher, um, if it can turn itself around, can try to become a technology company. So all these, uh, uh, yeah, basically all these uh, assets, they can be monetized in, uh, uh, in multiple ways. And here are some of the things, and I don't have to explain them all to you. Um, to build a sustainable business, you can't live off just one model here. But you create, you know, you know, you take multiple models and you create a sustainable business. But we're not in the, in the business of creating sustainable businesses. We are in the business of creating scalable businesses. So how to make it scalable? And that's where it becomes interesting. <coughs> so my thought is publishers need to become a technology company. Technology is the first thing they need to focus on. To give you some examples, what we do, uh, we uh, have our own development team, we create our own products, 
but uh, we also dive in uh, uh, to the analytics uh, to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, I don't know if you uh, read the article about BuzzFeed uh, today, uh, I think it was yesterday when they were talking about the dress. They can actually predict uh, how many uh, concurrent users they will uh, have on their servers in two hours. So those are things, if you know what works and know what, what comes, then you can uh, act on that. What I think everybody should do, or what we're trying to do, is we're trying to turn content into data. So we have these huge amount of uh, uh, articles and, and content, and we're trying to turn that into data so we can do analysis on top of that. And uh, we're building uh, uh, products uh, that uh, have other business models, more uh, models like uh, uh, the, yeah, the software as service models that you know from technology companies. So this is the one example I'm working on. Uh, it's called the index. Um, it's still in closed beta, uh, but uh, I, uh, if you sign up today, you can uh, definitely uh, expect an invitation very soon, hopefully tomorrow, uh, when, I'm, when I'm behind my computer again. Um, but index is, uh, is, some, is an attempt f f from us to extract all the data from the, uh, from the content uh, we follow uh, around 15,000 startups right now, and we follow them on all social networks and all everything we can find and build, in, uh, build that into a product so that we can predict which company um, is uh, going to grow, so uh, which company is going to move to the U.S. next year or from the U.S. to Europe and where they will open an office. So predictive analysis on startups, I think that that's going to be a huge thing. Uh, that's what we uh, uh, try to do with Index. Uh, it's a, a free uh, tool to use, uh, and um, it's pretty cool. And uh, I'll leave it up to, um, oh yeah, sorry. My conclusion is publishers, um, they will become tech companies, and if they're not, they will die soon. Uh, thank you very much. Um, John? Yeah, yeah it's fine. John, he's the CEO of a well-known and respected media, uh, the leading finance uh, media. In fact, it's the Financial Times. Um, like mine, where I work in El Pais, they have a print edition, uh, also a website, which is uh, what we mainly visit. And they are preparing new uh, business models, and here to, here's here to talk to us about it. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, hi. Can you hear me all? No, buenos dias. Uh, just waiting for the slides to come up. It seems to be the thing for today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the um, transformation we've been through. And the theme I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a possible future. So imagine if you don't have a website, because that's one of the questions which publishers have to ask themselves. So why? Why should I have a website? What's the point of it? And probably one of the most interesting things here, and the reason I came to four years from now this year, is to find the companies that help build the next platforms and the things that will change that. So why should I keep a website? Well, what tools do I need and what platforms do I need? And I couldn't agree more with Patrick's sentiment that publishers have to get some technology juice and really think about how they're going to build platforms. So what drives this possible future? What's the things that have happened that's made this uh, uh, an opportunity, a danger, it depends on your point of view as to whether you think you need a website or not. Um, so one of the things is people bought new devices. We know all about that here at Mobile World Congress, lots of new devices, lots of new ways of getting at content. Um, and in that, they started to engage with apps. They started to break out of the web and started to do things still on the internet, but it's not what we call the web. It's something else. They're engaging in a different way. And they also ha changed their habits. I don't know if, how many people are familiar with the um, the near IELTS work on uh, habit-forming products. But uh, I'll talk about it very, very briefly. But the idea is yeah, the triggers that you used to have have changed. So if you had a trigger, which used to be uh, very old school, let's say a paper landed on your doorstep or something like that, that was a trigger, you'd read it. So the triggers in the digital world have changed. And those people that engage very well in the digital world have rebuilt their habits and the habits of their, 
uh, their consumers and their audience by thinking about what action do I have to take once someone hits a trigger, how do I make them hit the trigger, what sort of reward do they get, and what locks them in, which is the investment of time you put into services like Facebook. You know, you put your photos up, and it's a pain to take them all off and put them somewhere else. So people tend to stick on these things. So these things change the habits as well. And you know, we've seen this a lot. This is some of our stats. And, um, it's often funny when people talk about their traffic and say mobile is 50% of our traffic or 60% of our traffic. But this is what it actually looks like for us, and it's a slightly different thing. So um, how people use things during the week. So you know the idea of average, so the, the principle of average being you can have your head in the oven and your feet in the freezer and you are a normal of average. But the different extremes you get, you can see here during the week, pink is mobile and blue is desktop. And you can see that at the weekend people use devices very differently. And understanding this, you can keep going into data and finding more and more angles about what people are actually doing. And this is crucial to understanding your, your services. So the habits change, and you have to think about that and what things do you need to build to engage with that. And people talk about mobile and they talk about desktop. We have people using the desktop site on their mobile. We have people using the uh, mobile site on their desktop. We have people using apps. We have people using all sort of mixed up models. So you have to think differently about what it means to be on these different devices. And what's interesting is just you know, the engagement models are different. So you have within them uh, that we have more users on our mobile site, but those people are more engaged on the, in the app. And that's you know, one of the things you have to think about why that is. And you have to think about volume. So volume, this is uh, where the advertising market sits. Uh, you can see social is uh, massive there. You can see search. You can see uh, news is that tiny little sliver up the top there. Um, Obviously, a lot of social is also actually news, but how you break all this out all depends on your point of view. And you have to think about advertising and think about what this means, because um, uh, this is John Slade. He's now MD of FT.com, used to be our advertising director. And he said, you're more likely to have twins than you are to click on a banner ad. And he knows because these are his twins, so it proves the point. But um, I believe he may have clicked on a banner ad as well. So, the, so you've got to think about all these models how they help you engage in this new world. And the partners have always changed. It used to be AOL, and it used to be who you'd be sucking up to, and now it was Google, and you've got to go and talk to Facebook. Maybe Snapchat might be interesting. So these things have always happened. The model and the engagement around where the traffic is has always changed. And it all just makes you wonder why you bother. This is the, you know, the sort of things that the platforms are saying, and the reason these platforms can do this is because they are offering, um, they're offering services and they're offering access to the audience, so you want that. But it does make you challenge, what's the point of my website? So it is quite complex. So I'm going to talk about the new content model. So the new content model is something slightly different. You're not really building websites anymore. You're thinking about content in a different way. You're thinking about how it's put together, lots of different pieces which come together for different platforms at different times, very contextual. And that's the goal to engaging in this market. And we do this with um, APIs. Most people are probably familiar with APIs, but that's an interface out to the different products we have running. And these are the three pillars underneath that. We have uh, membership as our user base. We have uh, universal publishing, which is uh, the content and metadata we have. That's the content store plus the metadata that connects things up. And we have a lot of data around how people use our services. And these things you know, are our strategy. Um, universal publishing helps us be where we want to be. Membership provides our community, and data helps us listen to the audience. Um, and the API is really our weapon of choice to get our services out to as many different devices as possible. So if you stop thinking about building a website, you start to think more like this. And that's actually quite a healthy thing, actually. And platforms are the reason that aggregators are bigger than you as a publisher. And that's something to think about. You know, the platform, and as Patrick said, think about technology. So technology is incredibly important in building the right platform. If you have a good platform, the audience tends to come back and engage with the platform as well as the content. So the content on its own is not necessarily king. It's a, it's a brilliant lie, that, but it's not necessarily true. Content plus technology gives you enormous power, and you can bring the audience and the content together. But you've got to have those two things together. So you've got to change your language. You, now you, the way we talk about web pages and reading content and page views, all this stuff has to change as well, because you're in a different place now. It's about engagement, and it's about being data-driven. It's about curation. It's about putting things together in packages. Now, when you still find yourself 
Most people here probably still talk about web pages. You just can't help yourself. It's just got into your psyche. But actually, what does that mean in Snapchat? You know, these are different things. So it's important to change your language when you're engaging in this new model. And you've got to think about packages. And you think about a single piece of content as being an article, but it's not. It's made up of uh, breakouts. It might be more images. It might be graphs and interactives. It might be video. It might be more video. It might be different slideshows. It might be different things that you want to put together into that package. So you start putting together things in this way, and then it's easier to engage in all these other platforms. And our language is changing as well. So, so Lionel Barber's coined a phrase called text plus, which helps him engage in the newsroom and saying, well, it's not just about text anymore. It's about more than text. It's about all the things that come with making that package go together. And moving from authors to story producers, because they're not just authoring one thing. They're putting together the package of things that you want. And you're moving from articles to themes. You want groups of stuff. And ultimately, you've got to start thinking about building everything so that you share and syndicate it. And if you treat your website in the same way, so you're syndicating to your own website, then that's something quite powerful as a mechanism to go anywhere else you want to go. And you've got to think about how you connect things together. So the connections you have, so going from one story to other stories, what's the thing that drives you along that? That's about how um, the relevancy works and contextual works that takes you from one story to the next. What's the thing that does that for you? So in this way, we start thinking about engagement and finding the right journey and aggregating hubs of content. Now, that's our future language as well. That's the things that we want to do. So what we're really doing is you're making products for an intelligent internet. I would say intelligent because it's not just about being contextual or being relevant. It's about actually thinking about um, not just publishing. It's about thinking about what it is that comes back from the audience. What are the things around you that you need to do in order to engage with that? And the things that really make up that are the intelligent users. They're thinking about what they want. You've got intelligent algorithms moving stuff around in Facebook. That's sort of deciding how much you get seen. You've got intelligent devices, and we'll be seeing loads of those, I'm sure, in the next few days. And there's intelligent networks that push stuff out in different ways, that are sometimes within products and sometimes not. So this is the internet you're engaging with, and it's made up of all these things. So to do this, we think about uh, these three things. We think of behavior and content and curation. So behavior is how people behave. So if you take those stats I was showing earlier, this is how a particular user might use different devices during the day. But you can also look at what content they look at on different devices. So you can see they look at different content on different devices at different times. And sometimes they like to engage at the weekend just on the tablet. They don't look at it on the desktop because they're in a different mode. So the more you understand this, the more intelligent you can make your products. And you've got to think about smart contextual similarity. So that's when you're trying to find ways to take people on this journey from one thing to the next. So when you write something, when you put content together, so I'm doing it as well, right? So you put a package together. You think about what's the next thing you want them to, to look at. And that comprises all these things, you know, who you are, where you are, which device, etc. So understanding this, the more you understand this, you can decide which products use these features and how that works. So intelligence is really about how the newsroom works. And the, that's where we would distinguish it just from being contextual. Because we see value in what we do as an organization, journalistically, and how we curate and make the content and push it out. Because people value that opinion. They don't just want the algorithm. They want something more than that. And now, this is what the newsroom used to look like over 100 years ago. And in, this is what it looked like 10 years ago. It hadn't changed that much. There's a few computers there running some old software some of us may have used. Um, now it's, no, we're, we're changing the layout. People sit around in groups and in hubs and look at things that they can all stand around and talk about together. It's about being much more engaged in that newsmaking process. So, so story producing comes from starting to think about how would they put things together as a group. And that's the intelligence that leads to thinking about different products. So FastFT is a stream product that we make, which is not thinking about pages. It's thinking about a stream of content that's most relevant to audiences. You've got categories and different ways of looking at it within there. So I mean, our transformations, these are the latest stats now from this year. So we're now 720,000 subscribers, and digital subs are 70% of that. So that's more subscribers than we've ever had in 126 years. And huge mo mobile engagement, now, up to 75% of subscriber activity is mobile. And I've said this before, the only thing that's surprising about that statistic is that it's not unusual anymore. That's fairly normal now if you're in a fairly digital service. Ultimately, subscriptions are more sustainable model, so that helps us. But we're also using advertising as well. 
And we use data a lot. This is a quote from our CEO. So this is something that we talk about a lot and we think about how we are going to engage with our audience based on data. And it helps drive our strategy. So membership makes content more valuable. So you can look at how you look at the data around membership and how that changes the way you, you engage with your audience. If you have a, a login, you have some way of engaging, that's quite useful. Um, you can also look at how you improve that. So you look at the data around how people um, subscribe to the FT. We're able to increase our subscriptions massively. So we use data a lot by tweaking things on the website, looking at things that most people would do now. But this is from some time ago around A-B testing and changing the way we we engaged with uh, the subscription workflow, how people came through our funnel, and we were able to increase that by 100%. So these are really useful tools for you. You also want to make your advertising more valuable. So um, we make it contextual. We think about how advertising links directly to the content it's related with, uh, making that very contextual. But we also think about you know, a lot of the ads are not viewed. So we've pioneered a different way of looking at advertising. So rather than thinking about um, just thinking about page views and banners and so on, um, because a lot of ads are not viewed. More than half, in theory, are not viewed. Um, we're asking advertisers, would you rather buy that, which is the standard viewability metric, or would you rather buy this? So we have developed a, time, uh, a metric called cost per hour. And cost per hour gives you, shows you the whole ad for five seconds at least. And that's quite a powerful metric as well. So cost per hour lets you see how our, how different users engage with your ad and for how long they engage with it, which is another mechanism in this new world. So it's high value. Membership keeps people in. It keeps bots out. And you can focus and target very accurately. So ultimately, you want to make your platforms more valuable. If you invest too much in features, then uh, you'll find that you haven't got enough investment in the platform, and the platforms will win. If you invest too much in platforms, obviously, they will, win. they will just not deliver any value to the end audience. So ultimately, you want to find some curve in the middle. I just call it the platform curve. But trying to find this balance is really hard. You're trying to find a way to invest the right amount in platforms and the right amount in the features. So there's an opportunity there for startups in thinking about how you make our content more value, how you help us build these tools. And to be more than just an algorithm, the thing that we really care about is being able to find ways of engaging and curating stuff. So engagement, incredibly important for us. Um, you can monetize better when your audience is engaged. You can improve it. You can drive better value in advertising, better value in content. And going back to the volume model, we don't really want to play the volume game because it's very hard to play the volume game of Facebook and Google. So we're thinking slightly differently. We're thinking about driving value to our content and our services. So moving from this model, where we thought about publishing and pushing things out, to a model where we think about a two-way interaction and we really engage with what's coming back in from our products, what's coming in from our users, what they want, how they're contextually behaving. And that's what we would think about as responding to an intelligent internet. We're trying to find ways that we can build out services that live in this ecosystem. So that's the value of your website. That's what we think. And thank you for listening. Before making uh, the questions uh, was preparing, uh, for me, it's what did you say intelligent when everybody's talking about uh, smart things and everything is smart? I, th I think for us, we're, um, we're thinking about intelligence because that's part of what we do. So if, if the uh, Financial Times was just an algorithm, mm -hmm. then ultimately someone else could create an algorithm. It might be better. It might not be as good. But you're, you're competing in a very dark place there, I think. The, the thing we're trying to do is take the value of the tools and the technology and combine that with the value of our journalists and the qualities that they have and the experience they have. I mean, one of the most interesting things is people talk about um, what would you like to read on the FT. A lot of people would like to read what our authors wrote to create the content. They're interested in what they went, what they're interested in. So people are very interested in, in, uh, in people, how they've created things, what they like, what they don't like. And that's part of our values. That's why I'd say intelligence rather than just um, uh, smart algorithms. Smart, yeah. uh, <laughs> do you think we are going to a model in which uh, instead of having uh, news which uh, are like curated for you, are going to be like custom news? 
that you're going to, to know us so well that uh, it's going to be so intelligent that we are going to have custom news? It, it may be. Um, I'm not quite sure what that future looks like. It could be quite scary or it could be amazing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I think about it and it's like, do you still need like an editorial pick? That's just my mm -hmm. opinion because if not, it's like, Maybe we all like fast food, but mom tell us from time to time you have to eat healthy and all that. So the new mom could be media telling us that, well, maybe you like kittens and watching babies in the internet, but also you should be interested in, in well, what you need to know apart from what you like to know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, if Facebook would, uh, people think about filters and self-filtering mm. groups. So if you like certain things, you tend to group yourself with people who like certain things. and. If you're not careful, you can find yourself in a world of stuff that you just like, but you're not very challenged by what other people are interested in. And part of you know, a journalist's job is to be challenging, think about yeah. these things and push out new ideas and give you reasons yeah, to, to shake engage. For a while. Yeah, to, to shake things up. You know? Yeah, we, we've done some tests with uh, a personal, a personalization of news. Um, didn't work that well. <laughs> no, um, it was funny to see. So, so we thought, okay, everybody can create their own. <coughs> uh, homepage and based on what what they've re read before, and then just people, in the end, yeah, they didn't like it. Yeah, how are you going to discover new things if yeah. you are always? In yeah, so especially what John said that people like to read what what our editors are writing. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> no uh, during your uh, exposition, there was like a controversial things in uh, in Twitter. Some people were saying that uh, data is not going to lead us uh, the opposite. You said that we have to make content into data. And they were saying that it was just the opposite. So what do you think? On, I, I just answer, maybe it's uh, like a round thing, a cycle that's yeah. going to be go, going and coming. Well, you know, when you have 10 minutes, you have to do yeah. something <laughs> controversial. So yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, no, no, true. I, 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 well, I think it's, it goes both ways. Uh, I think there's also a lot of interesting information in data that we can cover, of course, because that that that's that journalism, that bit yeah, thing. that's yeah. also journalism. <laughs> um, but for um, a publishing company to be competitive, and uh, if I listen to John's presentation, I think, hey, we do all that stuff, you know. So <laughs> we're we're basically uh, thinking the same way, and I think uh, uh, you tweeted something. Uh, that uh, publishers need to become a technology company, and <coughs> uh, uh, and that you agreed with me, and I think I think that's that's just the case. The, it, it's not anymore um, having uh, a newsroom and and typing uh, some articles together. Mm -hmm. It's it's also about the rest of the company that actually knows how to get that piece of content at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. to the right people. Well, clearly, I'm biased because I'm. I'm the CTO, so of course I'm going to agree with you in terms of <laughs> technology companies. Everything should be a technology company. But um, I think the, the, the thing that's interesting is that you can get quite um, scared by these sort of propositions. When Facebook say, uh, we want to host your content, uh, th there's, it's very easy to just crumble and just go, oh, well, that'd be so much easier. We should do that. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. You should use all these tools. But that has also been quite cyclical. When you look at the platforms that have come and gone, people used to think about portals. If anyone remembers portals, they might even be coming back. I don't know. But it's going to go around in these cycles. But what you do with your own services, the way you think about your content, is if you create content in a way that is uh, shareable and makes it possible to go wherever you want to be, then none of this will scare you. You can build your own website just as easily as you can get to. You can get the FT on Flipboard. You can get the FT on newsstand, you can, wherever we want it to be, we go. And that's probably one of the most you know, powerful things in the change in the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like two years ago, social was like the big, big thing. Like you say we are all using it day by day, and it's part of uh, the way we have, like, uh, sometimes I feel like those uh, public relations in the bars, like giving people flyers when I tweet things about what I write about. It's like, come on, come to my bar. We, we really make really good cocktails, but talking about news. So it's like going out there and taking the audience uh, coming mm. back. So um, that was two years ago. Now, like the next big thing is going to be messaging, or it, it is like uh, messaging apps. Uh, we've seen that BuzzFeed is doing something with uh, Viber. 
Um, also, Snapchat, just uh, 10 days ago, I started to, to make uh, some arrangement with, uh, I think it was ESPN and CNN. So how, how are you working on that uh, new field in the messaging and other things? We're looking into it. <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, resources. So we have a really good uh, social team, and, um, but you know, there are only two people. So uh, to be on all those platforms, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, there's also a lot of manual work there. Mm. Um, so I just saw in, my, in, in, in Slack, the communication yeah. tool we use internally, that we're, uh, we're going to do something with Snapchat. I don't know yet when, but uh, it will happen. Mm -hmm. So we're looking into these, uh, for instance. But for those uh, striptease thing, or no, I'm just kidding, no. the Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> no. But um, so th it's interesting because, for instance, for us, uh, we're really big in Russia on VK, V, yeah. v Contacte. Um, and, uh, uh, but we only, only write in English, so okay. it's uh, it, it, it's just where the audience is, where we go. So we test, I think, uh, that's mm -hmm. probably the best thing to say. Also with the messaging apps, we test if, it, if that works for us. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And what about you? Um, so so we, we engage massively on social media. I, I think that the whole point of our, our growth, because DFT is now probably healthier than it's ever been financially, is because it's taken advantage of the opportunities and other other publishers have done the same. Those that have and haven't been scared and tried to haul into themselves everything um, where you go out and you push out and you try and find ways to make these things work, you can be very, very, very successful. And they all have different uses for us. I think as well, when you, when you think about how, how things will change, so people are quite worried about uh, where the social networks will go, where the content goes, who owns it. And now the attribution model is all just broken there, you know, and how you know where anything came from. But also, um, when you look at the dress story, because like, we have to mention it again, <laughs> I guess. So, uh, you know, BuzzFeed owned that. It wasn't Facebook or anyone else. They owned it because they made the right emotional connection with the users. They had the right way of asking them the question that got everyone furious. It is blue and black, by the way, just in case. <laughs> uh, but the thing that also it happens at the same time as you take paper, so paper had the Kim Kardashian photos and they tried to break the internet as well. So you don't have to be BuzzFeed to do this, you just have to find the right, it's the right content and the right technology, the right KPIs engagement, yeah, yeah. The, right, the right thing to push. You know, what is, what is it that the, your audience is interested in? As I said, you don't have to be as big as Facebook. The internet's quite obsessed with growth. We're actually quite comfortable not being for everyone because there's a, if we would try to be everything to everyone, we wouldn't be as good at we do as what we are at what we do. So, you know, you, you have to be cautious about what you wish for. Yeah. What do you want so to there's be no the you? bus times coming? Then no, we probably won't have striptease <laughs> or anything on the FT. Bus no. time. No. That's a good idea. You said you have uh, two people on social. Uh, I, was, I thought you, like, everybody was doing that. What, what do you think would be, like, the, the right way to do in a newsroom? Because now we are just trying to have everybody doing it. Yeah, of course. So everybody is doing it, but there's right. there two people two uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on it, just pure on focusing on social. So, and, and, and that's actually small. I, uh, how many people are there at the Financial Times on, on social? Uh, um, I so I'm not going to give an answer to that because in theory they all are. We have social teams, but actually everyone's now thinking about pushing out to social. So there's a small team that yeah, but there's really a engaged. If, if between an editor yeah. pushes their own content mm. to Twitter mm. or if somebody is looking into Twitter and sees what works and republishes yeah, yeah. that. So they're community teams and yeah. so on. Yeah, so we've, we've got 20 to 30 in that plus a new audience engagement team. So they're buried in the newsroom now. So all of those, those, um, those people just really focused on pushing stuff and manipulating the, the social engagement. Mm -hmm. mm. Like uh, in November, we made a newspaper, like a little brainstorming with our editor-in-chief. And when we finished, he said something that it was quite new for him. He said, it's the first time that journalists ask me to hire more developers. So if you have to hire somebody or you were looking for a profile, what would you be looking for right now for your media? Uh, we're constantly looking for uh, for developers, uh, uh, back end, front end, and mobile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
but yeah, also but we're, we're also constantly looking for good good writers. Yes. So it's, uh, I think I think each company is always looking for good people. So in general, so uh, that that's not different, I guess, for a publisher than any other company. It, 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 especially in uh, development and technology, it's quite a fierce market. So we position ourselves on the way we're rebuilding ft.com is building things in a way that developers like to work on. So we're a very attractive proposition. We've you know, stopped using agencies. We tend to get more direct recruitment now because people want to come and work on the things we're building because they're fun and it's good technology and people like that. And that's, if you want to build a platform, you can't build a platform on technology that no one wants to work on. You're not going to build it on COBOL or some other thing that you're not going to find developers in. You, know, you need to be thinking about what are the technologies that attract good people and that actually are architecturally stable, things you're not going to have to pull apart again in two or three years. You know, that's been one of the crimes of technology is just constantly building things and then two or three years later, so sort of looking back and scratching your head and going, yeah, that probably wasn't such a good idea, actually. So, you know, it's being very aware of that and making things that will be resistant to those yeah. problems. Before being scalable, like you were saying. Uh, yeah. My last question before they make us get away and uh, Diane is going to kill us. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want this to ask you how important are for your both media uh, live streaming I mean, yeah, you were, uh, you were talking about the stream and all that. Yeah, and so for us, it's, it's really important that it's, it's not just a, a new engagement model. It's mm -hmm. not just about video. It's about it's content streaming and like all that, of those right. things put together, yeah. yeah. Um, what about you? Do you find it necessary? Um, I, I think we, we, have, we have troubles with finding the right audience mm -hmm. at the right time for live stream. Uh, because one, when we want to live stream, our audience is not awake. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to figure it out if that works and what the right model is. So if you do a live stream of this, yeah. should it be free? Mm -hmm. Should it be, should there be, should you register somewhere or not? Okay. So we, we try all different models. So we have done free, we have done registration. Mm -hmm. We have never done paid though. Okay. Have you done paid? Yeah, we've, we've had a go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. now the mandatory question before going out. Um, where do you see your media in four years time from four years from now? Four years from now. That's a good question. Yeah, because four years here is like ten years in any yeah. other thing. So. No, I, I well I, I, I hope that, that I'll be still around, that I'm so. I, I didn't get fired <laughs> by any investors or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, so for us for instance, th this year is going to be a big year with a lot of new uh, new stuff. Um, that we're working on, uh, and, and we expect to grow 100% this year. So in four years, I hope we're 10 times as big as we are right now. Okay. Yeah. In audience or no? In audience, uh, revenue, uh, everything. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, we, we've got a lot of growth plans. We'd like to get to a uh, much higher number of subscribers. We'd like to think about the, the platforms we have and finishing the work on those so we can start to bring more and more of the engagement back. Um, so like I say, we're not against any social platforms. We just want to be able to bring the engagement back that we want around our content and think about where's the best place for that. So sometimes it's not with us. And if you're comfortable with that, that's a good thing. If you know the right way, you'll get more engagement by putting it in the right place rather than trying to haul things back onto your website and sticking it in a comment section at the bottom of the page that no one sees. You know, so you've got to think carefully about what you really want. Okay. But okay. Thank you, John. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Pleasure. Thanks a Cheers. lot. Thank you.